Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to episode 39 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about the Denver Airport Conspiracies. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. Folks, in 1994, the city of Denver opened its new international airport, Denver International, and visitors were shocked by what they saw. And since that time, a number of conspiracy theories have developed around the Denver International Airport. And so that's what we're going to talk about today in this episode of Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World, the Denver Airport Conspiracies. So before we begin, Jimmy, this is a patrons episode. This was an episode picked by our patrons on patreon.com slash StarQuest. Yeah. So every every month we give the patrons a set of four options of what would they like us to take on as one of our episodes. And this month it was the Denver Airport Conspiracies. Uh, some people said they specifically wanted this one because it's a kind of lighter, funner thing. Yes. Yeah. It's not quite as heavy as some of our recent stuff, uh, which is yeah. good. We like to have that balance of things. Uh, we. we, we we, I love to get creeped out. Skinwalker Ranch really creeps me out. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> creeped a lot of people out. Yes, but uh, but which was good. It was fun. Uh, but this is fun, too. So I'm looking forward to talking about this. So, Jimmy, the, the, we call this the Denver Airport Conspiracies. That's the title of the episode. And mm-hmm. the, the term conspiracy theory is often used as an insult. But we're not using that way today, right? No, not at all. I, this is a kind of a pet peeve of mine when people use conspiracy theory as as if it's as if it automatically means you're crazy. And, you know, there are times maybe where that usage is appropriate because there are some that are just crazy. But conspiracy theories themselves are not crazy. Conspiracies really exist. That's why we have laws against them. Right. A conspiracy is any agreement involving two or more people to commit an illegal act. So if you and your buddy decide to knock over a bank, that's a conspiracy and you can be charged for it. And so conspiracies are very real things. And the term conspiracy theory is not meant by us to be pejorative at all. Uh, that's one of the things I like about, and I think other listeners like about th- what we do here is we, we, we don't approach this from a position of either superior attitude or dismissive. We take everything with a very rational, very straightforward, accepting things for what they are as, you know, as they're presented and examining them that way. So I, I really appreciate that approach myself. So uh, let's talk about the Denver airport conspiracies. What are the theories surrounding Denver International Airport? Well, we won't be covering everything because there's kind of a lot. But the basic claim is that something very sinister is going on at the Denver International Airport. But what precisely it is, is not always clear. In particular, different claims are made about who's responsible for whatever weird things are happening there. According to some claims, it's the Freemasons. According to other claims, it's the Illuminati. According to others, it's Satanists. According to others, it's people who want to bring in the so-called New World Order. So you have a lot of different groups that get fingered as these are the villains who are who are conspiring against us in some way. And... So you have different groups of villains that are proposed. You also have different things that are proposed for, well, like, if they're conspiring, what are they conspiring to do other than put up bizarre artwork? Some see the airport as the site of a bunker that is to be used in a future man-made disaster that could kill millions or billions of people. And some people see it as a place they're housing aliens, although that's not really illegal, but that's one thing that's being claimed. And then, you know, of course, the alternative theory is that none of this is true and that the Denver International Airport is just an airport, although one that has really weird, tasteless art. Is there a particular reason that the Denver Airport is is the the source of these conspiracies more so than other airports? 
Yeah, well, it, I mean, that kind of gets us into the evidence that gets okay. that gets cited for this. Basically, there's sort of two kinds of evidence that Denver Airport conspiracy theorists will cite. The first is practical evidence. They will say it, there's the two categ- categories are practical evidence and artistic evidence. On the practical side, they will say, well, Denver built this airport, but they didn't need it. They already had an international airport, a Stapleton International Airport. So they build this whole thing. And then it has this huge cost. Uh, At the time it was built, back in the 90s, it cost uh, $5 billion. And today it would be about $8 billion. And they'll say that there were these huge cost overruns. And where did that money go? Well, according to some of these theories, it went into building extensive subterranean diggings, that there are all these tunnels under the airport and bunkers down there. And these bunkers then are being used maybe as a a hideout for aliens. Some people will say reptoids in particular, these reptilian aliens. Other people will say there's a FEMA bunker down there. FEMA is the Federal Emergency Management Agency. And some people have said FEMA is itself a conspiracy to cause like an American Holocaust that's going to wipe out millions and millions of people and dramatically reduce the population. And FEMA is going to seize control and herd people into into camps. And uh, maybe that's one of the things that's under the Denver airport. Uh, others would say, well, it's not that, but maybe there's like a fallout shelter there or some kind of continuity of government site that's down there so that the you know government officials, government and military officials could hole up and save themselves in the event of a nuclear war while the rest of us die. And so those are those are some of the the practical pieces of evidence why people zero in on Denver Airport in particular. Okay, and you mentioned artistic evidence. What is what artistic evidence is there for this? Well, the basic idea is that whoever is responsible for for the Denver Airport conspiracies, for some reason, they're even though they're 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 conspiring and thus keeping part of what they're doing hidden. They're also sort of exhibitionists and they they can't resist dropping hints to the fact that there's a big conspiracy here just to, to I guess, rub it in the public's face. It's like, haha, we're doing something, but you can't prove it. And among the claims here is that if you look at an aerial diagram of the runways, you know, like you, let's say you had a drone and you're hovering above the airport or you look down with a satellite, which you, I guess actually can do on Google Maps, you'll see a, a, a diagram of the runways that looks like a swastika. You know, so obviously that's sinister, except in Native American and Eastern religions where it's not. Also, there is a Masonic plaque at the Denver airport that refers to the New World Airport Commission. So obviously that's the New World Order tipping its hat through the New World Airport Commission. There's a a statue of a horse that it looks evil. And actually, it not only looks evil, it is evil because it killed the sculptor that made it, which is actually true. And we'll talk about that. And then they have these like gargoyles at baggage claim that look sinister. And they have all of this weird art of murals of like children and Nazi gas mask figures and weapons and stuff like that. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> OK, so. Uh, that's the uh, so we have this ev- the evidence that's out there. Uh, the, there's is there a and you mentioned the the evil horse and it looking it looks evil. Mm-hmm. Is there a faith perspective to all of this though that we want to cover here? Not really. Uh, if there is an evil conspiracy behind the Denver International Airport, well, then it's evil. But there aren't really theological implications beyond that. The conspirator conspirators would need to repent. Okay, that that's. Pretty straightforward then. Yeah. So from the reason perspective, what should we make of the claim that Denver International Airport wasn't needed because Denver already had an airport at Stapleton International Airport? Well, here's the thing. Stapleton was built in 1929. And so by the 1990s, this was, you know, this was a 60, 70 year old airport and it wasn't built for modern planes. Its runways were short by modern standards. And so that made it hard for jets to take off. I mean, 
jets have, hadn't even been invented in 1929. The jets didn't come along until world, the World War II era, and even then they weren't in common use. So we have much bigger, faster passenger planes now that need more room to take off. Also, the runways at Stapleton crossed each other, and that meant you could only use half of them at a time because if you've got a plane coming down one runway, you cannot have a plane coming down another runway at the same time. And so they could only use half of the runways they had. Uh, it was consequently a busy airport that was known for having long delays, especially in bad weather. Another thing about Stapleton is because of when it was built, Denver was smaller, and so Stapleton is five times closer to the city center. And that means when you have modern jets taking off there, now that Denver has grown out around everything, you got lots of noise complaints. You know, people didn't like airplanes, you know, these big, huge jets taken off right over their homes and businesses. So you had noise complaints about Stapleton. They couldn't grow the airport anymore. There were, you know, to ease the delays people were having, they, they had no room to expand the airport or lengthen the runways because uh, Stapleton was bumping up against other people's property. And one of the properties was the Rocky Mountain Arsenal which was where chemical weapons had been made and had become so polluted that it was later a Superfund cleanup site with the EPA and the Environmental Protection Agency. And so it really wasn't a great environment to, to have for your airport anyway. So there kind of was a need for Denver to have a new airport. It's very common, I think, in the West. A lot of these airports in the West ran into the same similar problems uh, where they had airports that when the cities were younger, the airports were built and they were built closer to the city center, but the cities then grew, the airports couldn't, and they had to build them further out. I, yeah. I, I've flown into Denver and I've flown into Austin. Austin is the same way. So interesting, interesting point then. Yeah. So what should we make of the claim that the airport cost much more than it should with the implication that that money was then used for sinister purposes uh, uh, as a under black project. Well, it's easy to make that claim, but without looking at the books, it's unverifiable. I haven't seen anybody who said we looked at the books and there's a serious accounting problem here. It's it's a known fact that major building projects often have cost overruns. Uh, this is just something that government does. And there are various reasons for that. In this case, one of the reasons that Denver Airport cost more than was initially expected is because it had to be redesigned in the middle of the process. United Airlines is one of the airlines that uses it as a hub. And United said, whoa, wait a minute, we need all these other things to be done that weren't part of the original plan. And so they had to go back to the drawing board on part of the uh, airport and redesign it in order to meet the requirements made by United Airlines. Then there were other problems. Uh, they had, you know, labor can drive up the cost of things. And there was a strike by workers that hindered the timely completion of the airport. And also there was a really poorly designed baggage handling system that they worked on and worked on. And ultimately they had to bag it. Uh, it just did <laughs> not perform to specification. And so they wasted all this money on this baggage handling system that was really fancy and ultimately they couldn't couldn't use. Yeah, I remember that being reported in the news at the time, just how like this system was so bad that it would, these the bags would become dangerously airborne inside the handling <laughs> yeah. system. And you don't want, don't want anything at an airport becoming dangerously airborne. <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly. So okay, yeah, and it's, it's, it's a government program, uh, presumably. Cost overruns is sort of the thing. Yeah. So okay, so what should we make of this claim that the airport has these extensive subterranean diggings uh, all around. Well, that's actually true. They really do have these massive tunnels below the airport. There's almost half a million square feet of excavation down there. Uh, the question is, why? What is? What are all these diggings for? And um, the according to the airport, it's a workspace. They've got around a thousand employees working under the airport every day. The tunnels are used for things like plumbing and electrical infrastructure that you need to run the airport. That's where baggage handling is done. You, they also have an underground train down there, which I believe it was like to shuttle passengers from one ter yes. terminal to another. 
And yes. so they they actually they 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 have a reason for having stuff under there. The question is, is that all that's down there? And uh, to try to uh, assure people that there isn't anything sinister going on under the airport, the airport actually gives tours now of the underground facilities. So you can go down there. I don't know that they have them all the time, but they they have taken people down and said, hey, you know, we'll give you a tour. I mean, look at this great boiler we've got. (laughs) And, And here's part of the baggage system we had to bag and stuff like that. And consequently, you know, on the tours, there has not emerged any evidence of actual aliens under there, but airport employees have been known to prank the tourists by wearing lizard masks. So... <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy, that doesn't help. <laughs> yeah, there is uh, there's no evidence of a FEMA camp down there, a federal emergency management agency camp for a planned future Holocaust. What I find plausible, though, I mean, I I don't have any proof of this, but there's a surface plausibility. I can't rule out that there's a a big fallout shelter or continuity of government site down there. And the reason I say that is we know about other continuity. So what continuity of government is, is strategy that the U.S. developed in the Cold War, where we said, okay, what if we suffered, what if we had a nuclear war? What if we suffered a first strike by the Soviets? And they drop a bomb on Washington and decapitate our government. So how do we deal with that? And one of the solutions was to come up with the Internet. That's where we got the Internet. So that uh, it was it was originally called the ARPANET because it was developed by DARPA, which is a kind of government uh, sponsored think tank to research and develop you know, strategic things and defense technology, defense technologies. Yeah. yeah. And so the idea for the Internet was we want to be able for information to route itself around the holes that nuclear weapons would punch in our communications infrastructure. So, like, let's say you're in Washington, you need to get a message to Denver, but the St. Louis phone hub has been nuked. What do you do? Well, if you've encoded the information in a packet that can route itself through the surviving links in the communications network, it can work around the fact St. Louis is down and get where it needs to go in Denver. And so that's the principle behind email and basically, you know, stuff on the Internet in general. So the Internet is one thing that we did, but also they said, well, we need to have plans in place to physically protect us, not just our, 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 our information, but also our human assets. So government officials, their families, in some cases, military officials, how do we keep our key personnel safe? And so they established what are called continuity of government sites. And we know about some of these now. One of them is uh, on, the, on the East Coast. It's a place called Raven Rock. And we'll be doing a future episode on Raven Rock. Also, right there in Colorado, we have the Cheyenne Mountain facility, which is, you know, near Denver International Airport. I mean, it's, you know, within 100 miles or so, I think. And that's the home not only of Stargate Command, but also of NORAD. I could easily see government planners saying, you know, Denver is a major airport hub. And if we saw a nuclear war coming, we've got these strategic facilities there in Colorado, like Cheyenne Mountain. And so we could start routing key officials to Denver International Airport in hopes of getting them to these other places. But maybe the war happens too quick and we need them to hunker down at Denver International Airport. It's an airport. It's easy to get people there in an emergency, so let's put a continuity of government site right under Denver International Airport, just like we've got Raven Rock on the East Coast. And so that makes sense to me. I don't have proof of that, but this is this is like the one thing that I think has plausibility about the Denver airport conspiracies. Yeah, the idea that even if it wasn't like federal government officials flying in, the Colorado state government might want to have a continuity of government 
site as well, given mm -hmm. that sure. because Cheyenne Mountain is there, it would be a primary target in a nuclear war. So that probably would make sense to have a continuity government for them. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. So the, one of the other things we have is a claim that the, if you look at an aerial diagram or Google Maps, I have it right on my screen right now, a Google Map view, satellite view of Denver International Airport, and the runways look like they are laid out in the form of a swastika. So how is this a sign that it, that this is a, that they're giving us of what the intention of this airport is? Well, it does kind of look like a swastika, but only kind of, sort of. And there's actually a reason it looks like that. You remember how the problem with Stapleton was, or one of the problems with Stapleton was that the runways crossed each other. And so you could only use half of them at one time. Well, if you think about, I want to be, I don't want, to have traffic delays of that kind ever again, I want to be able to launch as many planes as possible. How would you design your runways? Well, a logical way would be to say, let's have runways pointing in all four directions. So we've got a runway pointing to the north, one to the south, one to the east, and one to the west. Okay, so that gives us a cross. Okay, but we also need planes to be able to taxi before to and from the terminals before they they take off and land. So let's bend each of these runways so that uh, they have one leg of the runway where they can take off and land and then another leg of the runway where they can taxi. So at while a plane is taking off, you can have another plane taxiing. So if you then have your north, south, east and west runways and you bend all of them to create the takeoff and landing strips, you get a swastika. And that's just a natural form follows function thing. So there is an explanation that's perfectly conventional for that. Also, if you look at if you actually look at the image, it's not just these runways. There are these connecting roads and things that like trains and, you know, all the equipment they use to service the planes are meant to go down. And so it's if you look at the overall design, it's not simply a swastika. It's more complex than that. You can see a swastika in it, kind of, even though the legs of the runways aren't all the right length. You can kind of sort of see one, but it's only kind of sort of, and there's actually an innocent explanation for this. It's uh, another example of a par pareidolia. pareidolia. Yeah. You know, the, and if you look at it, the, the runways are like the north, south, and east, west runways are offset, yeah. which allows planes to take off and land at the same time. So while one plane's taken off, other planes can land which you wouldn't be able to do if they weren't offset. Mm -hmm. So that makes sense as well. So that's uh, that's interesting. So then what about this? We hear about this New World Airport Commission or and this Masonic plaque. What What is this all about? Well, there is there is actually this little monument that they have there. It's got a time capsule in it and on it's made out of stone. And on the stone time capsule, there is a Masonic symbol. It's got a famous symbol you see on a lot of Masonic temples. It's the G inside of a compass, which is a symbol for the great architect of the universe, which is one of the ways Freemasons talk about God. It's dedicated by the members of the Grand Lodges of Colorado, and it's got their names on the inscription right there. These are the people who paid for this. So it's not exactly secret. They're just out there. This is just a donation by these local Masons. It's dedicated to the New World Airport Commission, whose contributors are also named in the inscription. So they're not being secret. The time capsule is dedicated to the people of Colorado in 2094. So it's scheduled to be opened on the 100th anniversary of the airport. And we know what's in the time capsule. They put some coins in it. Uh, they put in a signed baseball from the opening day at Coors Field. I assume that, I'm not a baseball fan. I assume that's a baseball field in Denver, maybe. It is. It, they also had a, a pair of the then mayor's sneakers and some Blackhawk casino chips, some newspapers, a credit card, and a Colorado flag. And I think of all that, probably the thing that the people in 2094 will be most interested in is the credit card because they won't have those. <laughs> yes. Will, there, will it still be usable? Will there yeah. be credit on it? That's yeah. the question. <laughs> in terms of the people who placed this plaque, well, as I said, they're, it's not, they're not making any secret of who they are. Their names are on it. Uh, sure, they're Freemasons, but in... The United States, Freemasons are basically a kooky men's club. Uh, they're not. They they're not really a, a 
organized, aggressive, sinister conspiracy. They may have been that in the past, and they may be that in other countries, but here they're largely a kooky men's club. Uh, I have a close family member who is a Freemason, and that's a pretty accurate description. Uh-huh, yeah. <laughs> Isn't there like a lot of these groups that got started in the 19th century? And Freemasons actually date a little earlier than that, but especially a lot of them got started in the 19th century. And it was th- the thing to do if you were a man at the time to join a fraternity of other men and give yourself outrageous, ridiculous titles and wear silly clothing. Uh, it was just lots of people did that. So it, what about the New World Airport Commission? Well, that was founded by a guy named Charles Ansbacher. And according to him, it's not named after the New World Order. It's named after Dvorak's New World Symphony. Which, by the way, is a really great symphony. The New World, in this case, is a reference to America. So I I believe the formal title of the New World Symphony is From the New World. And so it's like a symphony celebrating America. And there's this moment in the symphony where the violins just soar, and it is heavenly, and it needs to go on for five minutes, but it's over in two seconds. Um, (laughs) So I've always been unhappy about that part of the New World Symphony because it's so awesome. It just needs to go on longer. In any event, uh, that's what he says this airport commission was named after, this symphony that celebrates America. The plaque was uh, placed because the people and groups named on it donated to build the airport. So this is a common thing. You donate to build something, they put up a plaque in your name. Right. The the least they can do is put a plaque in, with your name on it. Yeah. Or or at least in this case let you put up a plaque with your name on it. <laughs> That's true. That's true. So what about this sinister looking horse statue? I've seen this. This yep. it's a huge statue of a horse. Kind of reminds a little bit of the Denver Broncos Bronco on their stadium symbol, but it's different. So what about this this statue? Yeah, so it's in front of the airport. It is huge. It's 32 feet high. It's made of fiberglass, and it is anatomically correct. It weighs 9,000 pounds, so four and a half tons. It has glowing red eyes and is blue in color. Its official name is Blue Mustang, and I, I can't help but wondering, is there a reference to the Denver Broncos there, or is it more generally a reference to, like, Colorado Mustang horse culture. I think that's it. Yeah. But uh, the locals, because it looks so sinister, the locals have nicknamed it Blucifer. (laughs) And uh, before it was installed, it did fall on and kill its creator, an artist named Luis Jimenez, when a piece of its head broke off and cut an artery in his leg. Wow. But that's that's not presumably that wasn't deliberate. It's not like the conspirators pushed it over on him from what we can (laughs) tell. Right, right. There could, there could be a whole nother mystery about this, just about this statue that we could come back to maybe someday. But uh, OK, so the we have Lucifer. What is other weird art in the airport that you mentioned? What is all this other weird art? So, as I mentioned, there are gargoyle statues that sit around baggage claim and gargoyles, you know, look kind of uh, technically these are grotesques. A gargoyle, properly speaking, is a statue that has a water spout in it because that's what gargoyles did was they would channel water off the roofs of churches. And um, and so they made a gargling sound. It's onomatopoeia. That's why they're called gargoyles. And the other figures that we see that don't have the water spout, but that look similar are kind of, you know, they're kind of monster, little monster looking things. And so they're called grotesques because they look grotesque. Well, these are a common thing on churches. So if you can put them on churches, you could put them in an airport if you wanted, I guess. And in fact, that seems to have been part of the inspiration for these statues because they're referred to as the Notre Denver sculptures instead of the Notre Dame sculptures after Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris that I guess has gargoyles and and grotesques on it. So for some reason, they I have no idea why, but for some reason they decided, let's put some gargoyles on baggage claim and maybe it'll be fun for people to look at while they're waiting interminably for their baggage to arrive from the system that doesn't work. The vagaries of taste in public art is a whole nother discussion. Yeah, oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> it, and and it gets it it's, gets even more intense because, as I mentioned, there are also these murals that they have that have disturbing images on them. Like one of them has this Nazi-like soldier in a gas mask, and he's got a sword and a machine gun. And he's killing a dove and looming over ruined buildings with weeping people in the background. 
One of them has children from all over the world in native dress, and they're standing above another fallen Nazi-like figure in a gas mask. So these people have looked at this and said, oh, man, this is what is going on here? I mean, this one looks like it's got dead children in it. This has living children, but they're with this Nazi figure. This one has a Nazi figure, you know, attacking stuff. What is, what is up with all this weird art? Uh, some additional perspective is provided when you realize the names of these pictures are, in one of them, In Peace and Harmony with Nature, and The Children of the World Dream of Peace. So like the one where you got the children uh, in, of the world in all their native costumes s above the fallen warlike figure, that's the children dreaming of peace. So it's not like celebrating violence. It's celebrating the opposite. It's celebrating the defeat of violence by peace. That's what the artist, a guy named Leo Tenguma, has said, that these uh, pictures depict man-made environmental destruction and genocide, along with humanity coming together to heal nature and live in peace. So it's about the triumph of peace and good stuff over war and bad stuff. Uh, according to Tenguma, quote, I have children sleeping amid the debris of war, and this warmonger is killing the dove of peace, but the children are dreaming of something better in the future, and their little dream goes behind the general and continues behind this group of people, and the kids are dreaming that peace will happen someday. See how the little dream becomes something really beautiful, that someday the nations of the world will abandon war and come together, close quote. So that's his idea behind these paintings. Having said that, they look weird and ridiculous, and it's another example of atrocious 20th century public art. Yeah, g given that going to the airport in the these days is generally a, a hard experience yeah, as it is, yeah. <laughs> having to see, see images of this, these warlike images probably doesn't bring much peace. So is there a broader point we should take away from all this weird art in the airport? Uh, there's a couple. One, there's just lots of horrible 20th century art. Art really fell off a cliff in the 20th century. And uh, you can see this a number of years ago, an exhibition of the Vatican treasure, art tre museum treasures came here to San Diego. It was touring the United States. It came here to San Diego and the staff of Catholic Answers went down as a group to look at it. And you would see all this great art from the past. And then you come to the 20th century and even in church art, it's just suddenly fallen off a cliff and looks horrible. I remember looking at uh, vestments that they had made for John Paul II for the year 2000, you know, the third millennium. He was going to celebrate this mass and they made these special vestments for him. And and they're like purple and shiny. And it looks like a priest costume off Star Trek Voyager was my impression. <laughs> it just was awful. So, you know, that's kind of one of the things to take away from this is this just fits in with what's going on in art anyway. but also. In terms of conspiracy theories, why would you announce yourself like this? I mean, if this did have some sinister meaning, why would you do this? Uh, it doesn't make sense. If, you're, if you really want to be a conspirator, you don't go around announcing it. And you think about successful conspiracies in the past, they do not tip their hands like this. They, you, you didn't have, you know, the Watergate burglars taking out an ad in the New York Times going, ha, 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 something's going on and you don't know what it is. So it, successful conspiracies just don't do this. And so it's implausible to claim that this art is the conspirators tipping their hands. I, I would say in general, a successful tenet to a good conspiracy is secrecy. That, yeah. that if you if you want to have a good a successful conspiracy, you must keep it secret. Yeah. And, uh, th and that's these uh, this evidence, quote unquote, uh, would it, it'd be against that. So. So how has the airport officials and, and people there, how have they reacted to all the these conspiracy theories? Well, they've reacted surprisingly well. They have basically uh, laughed it off and they've kind of like gone along with the joke a little bit. I mentioned how the like some of the uh, employees have pranked tourists by putting on reptile masks in the underground tours. They put up a the airport put up a, and you sent you sent me a video of this. So we'll have a link. Yeah in the show notes, but you sent me a video where the airport had put up a talking gargoyle. So you have people walking down the, the, the hallway in the airport, and all of a sudden this gargoyle statue starts talking to them. 
and and <laughs> engaging in witty banter and stuff like that. It's hey, you there in the cowboy hat, you know what's going on, and trying to engage people. So that's a sign of you know sense of humor. In October of 2016, uh, so you know just a couple of years ago, they had uh, they devoted the month of October. They renamed they named it Conspiracy Month. And they celebrated the conspiracies about the airport. They put on an exhibit. They had a costume party. They showed conspiracy themed movies and it all built up to Halloween. So they were they were having fun with it. So the what's your bottom line on the Denver airport conspiracies, Jimmy? Then? The, the only uh, Denver airport conspiracy theory that's plausible is that there's a fallout shelter or continuity of government facility down there. I don't have proof that that's the case, but it does make sense that this is the kind of place you might put one. And so it I, it's not proven, but it's at least plausible to me that there could be one down there. Everything else is more plausibly explained in conventional ways, including the expectedness of government cost overruns and the expectedness of horrible 20th century public art. If folks wanted to have uh, to, to look a little more into this, do we have some further resources we can offer them? Yeah, so I, I'll have a link in the show notes to Wikipedia's article on Denver International Airport. Also, article from the Denver Post that's a guide to the different conspiracy theories. So it'll have pictures of the different things and an explanation of here's what the claim is and here's what the answer is. Uh, Rational Wiki, which is a kind of skeptical website has an article on the Denver airport conspiracy, as I'll also link to. There's a video on YouTube that also has pictures and goes through this. And then there's the link to the video of the Denver airport talking gargoyle. Trust me, that's a, that's a nice, fun video. Is, folks. So the, they, they have a comedian who can see the people, and he's very good at improv and uh, engage with folks, especially with kids. It's really cute. So give give that a look. Great. So we have uh, also, as we usually do, we have some mysterious feedback from listeners from our previous shows, and I'd like to read some of those, and uh, then Jimmy can respond to them. We have a, a more general piece of feedback from Matthew on Facebook, who asks, do these schedule to release at noon on Fridays? I need to remember to not leave for lunch until 12.01 on Fridays, or you could release them at 11.30 a.m. Eastern time, and that's that's the thing. It's, uh, I, I, I do the scheduling, and they do re schedule to release at noon. Yeah. Eastern time on Friday. But we talked about it and uh, there's no reason we can't release them earlier. So for you, Matthew, and everyone who would like to listen to the show earlier on Fridays, we're going to be releasing it early. So even if you're on the East Coast and you want to like listen to it on your commute into work, it'll be released early. Yeah, I'll try to I'm, I'll try to figure out a, a good time, but I, I'm aiming probably going to aim around, say, 730 on Friday mornings, 730 Eastern time. Friday mornings. Uh, there is some manual bits that have to be done, so that's yeah. why I said it at noon because it's convenient for me. Yeah. But and the the manual things Dom will continue to do, you know, at his convenience. But in terms of the major automatically scheduled release, that'll be earlier. Right. You you won't miss, maybe won't be able to get the Mysterious World Bookstore links right away, but the links are in the show notes anyway. But, yeah. So that that's it. And then uh, we we have a link that goes up on Instagram, and that might not be available right away, but. But that's fine. I, I want to make sure you get be, to be able to listen to the show. I used to love listening to podcasts on my way into work uh, on my commute. And so I understand. So I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll get those out earlier for you and you'll be able to listen to them earlier on Friday. It'll actually help me, too, because I, I like to listen for quality control when they're released. And I tend to wake up early and that's a good time before I start work to listen. All right. More feedback uh, on our episode on Hitler's religion. Uh, Hans Georg Lundahl, I hope I pronounced that right. On YouTube, he first he had a quote from me. I said, Adolf Hitler may have been the most sinister figure of the 20th century. And then he, he responds, I think Lenin might be that question. And he had that as a question mark. Yeah. So I we had several comments from people like this. And I wanted to kind of leap to Dom's defense on this because I write the outlines and the intros. Dom may rephrase them a little bit, but I write those. And I was the one who used the word sinister. And I used it deliberately because I knew there was an argument that you can make about, like, who's the most deadly? You could say, well, Hitler actually wasn't the most deadly. It was Stalin or Mao or someone like that. And so I picked Sinister because he looms larger in the Western imagination. Hitler does. Looms larger in the Western imagination than Stalin or Mao. And so I wanted to use a subjective term 
and that could help us avoid discussions about technically who killed more people. Unfortunately, it didn't work, but I, I <laughs> that was the intent. And so uh, I just wanted to say, don't blame Dom for that. If you want to blame somebody, blame me. Although I agree. I mean, if you think about it, which the more loaded term? If you were to call someone a Stalinist, a Maoist, or a Nazi, Right now in, in the Western world, yeah. calling someone a Nazi is the, is the much worse thing. You, so. You'll notice whenever people want to smear someone they don't like, they'll say, oh, this person reminds me of Hitler. They don't typically say, this person reminds me of Stalin. I mean, you won't hear that as much. And why, that's why we have Godwin's law of sooner or later, every argument ends in a reference to Hitler. <laughs> exactly, exactly. All right, uh, more on that episode. Uh, Angel7777 on YouTube says, uh, Hitler was essentially a pantheist. He would have subscribed to something similar to modern New Age belief. He believed it was his duty to make his ideas come true and that he would be greater than Jesus because he saw Jesus as a failure. He believed he could find the God in himself and purify the earth. He absolutely hated Christianity, especially the Catholic Church, because he knew it would stand against everything he believed. I truly think it was his plan to first destroy the church, then declare himself God as his victory. Well, I I think that's I think that's broadly fair up and and accurate up until the last bit. I don't think he wanted to declare himself God. Uh, in fact, we we have a quote where he was talking to Albert Speer and he was kind of mocking Heinrich Himmler for wanting to you know be more mystical. And he said, you know, could you imagine me as as a, as an SS saint one day? I mean, I would roll over in my grave. So I think he did view himself as the instrument of destiny, but I don't think he wanted to declare himself God. That doesn't correspond to the evidence that that I have. But I think the rest of what uh, you said, Angel 7777, is is broadly accurate. I might tweak a thing or two here or there, but you have a, a correct summary, basically. So I agree. Christ04 on YouTube says, I personally believe that Hitler's genocide would have surpassed all others over time if he'd won. You have to remember there were a lot of non-Aryans in the world. I think it was Satan's last, latest attempt through a man to achieve what he eventually will through the final Antichrist. All the means and technology is there now to successfully control everyone. If you don't go along with the system, all they do is flip a switch and your money and means of living are gone. And uh, indeed, I think that it's quite fair to look at Hitler and say this is a foreshadowing of the final Antichrist and things the final Antichrist uh, is likely to do. And if you want to see an imagining, a Hollywood imagining of what it would have been like if Hitler had won, the uh, Amazon Prime show Man in a High Castle, which we talked about, would be a good example of yeah. of what, what it would have been like. So very good. Uh, or not very good, but thank you, for Christ, Christ 04, for your feedback. And then we have uh, some feedback from a new patron. Dan sends an email. He says, keep up the great work with Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World. I've been a listener slash subscriber from episode one and have enjoyed each and every one. You guys are hitting all the E's that I look for. The shows are entertaining, educational, and enlightening. The trifecta of entertainment. I finally became a patron a few weeks ago. I listened to most of your shows while running, so I'm not in a position to jump on Patreon. In fact, I'm trading for the Boston Marathon. Ooh, good raising luck. Money for, yeah, yes, he's raising money for St. Vincent de Paul. And Mysterious World has been a welcome and valued companion during my Saturday long runs. There are some trading runs that we use a lot. And as I pass certain areas, I'll think, I was running here during the Outlove Pass. I, I have the same thing. I listen to loads of audiobooks. And so when I'm driving and sometimes on lo long road trips, I'll think, hmm, I was I was driving past this mall in Orange County when I heard about the interracial kiss in the in the Plato stepchildren episode of Star Trek in the history of Star <laughs> Trek book I was listening to at the moment several years ago. <laughs> yeah, there are still areas of central Pennsylvania that make me think of Scott Hahn because I was listening to his tapes uh -huh. <laughs> while I was commuting back and forth to school. And thank you so much for your support, Dan. We really appreciate uh, it. We really appreciate it. It's your support and that of our other patrons that lets us do this show. Yes, so much. Uh, and also, good luck in the Boston Marathon. Welcome to town. I'm, I'm in the Boston area, so welcome to town, and I hope you do very well. So that's our feedback, and uh, so we move on to mysterious headlines. Jimmy, do you have some mysterious headlines for us this week? I have a couple. One of them, so obviously Dyatlov Pass has been of interest to people, and uh, we announced in a recent headline that Russia was reopening an investigation to what happened to the hikers at Dyatlov Pass, and now we have an update. 
on that. There is a video you can watch that features Russian drone footage that they took as part of the new Dyatlov Pass investigation. They're hoping to have results of the investigation in August, but already you can click the link and uh, watch uh, some footage that they took with a drone examining part of this uh, area it, that there. So you can actually, you know, see live recorded footage of what Dyatlov Pass looks like today. Very cool. All right. I know people are really interested in that episode. Yeah, so, and yeah. it gives you, it's nice to, rather than just still photos, it's nice to be able to get an aerial view of, okay, here's the mountain, here's the pass, here's the tree line and the forest, and here's and where they were and stuff. And another headline? Yeah. Um. So speaking of cold places, it may be because a cooler ancient earth is why we have diamonds. There's a, a question of how did diamonds form in the crust of the earth? And it may be that the fact Earth cooled in the way that it did is what's responsible for us having diamonds. So whereas they found one planet, uh, exoplanet, where it like rains diamonds here on Earth, we may have got them because of how our planet cooled. So there's a link to that. Uh, that's why gangsters always call it ice. ice. I was just going to make that <laughs> pun. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Excellent. Thank you so much. That's that's great. But, so before we sign off, of course, uh, like we thanked Dan, we do want to thank our patrons. And as Jimmy said, you make it possible for us to keep doing this. Uh, we we love to do the show for everyone, but the the fact is, is we need financial support in order to bring you this show and all the shows we do at StarQuest. And and that's why we want to, we thank patrons by like having having them choose topics like Denver Airport conspiracies for us. Right. And we're we're, we're looking for uh, new ways that we can include them in the particip participation in uh, the, the, making the show and, and creating the content and we'll be rolling that out in the future, but uh, we want to, to to do that as a way of saying thank you for your support. And to and to to make it worthwhile. So, and this time, one of the ways we say thank you is we want to thank you by name. And this week, we're thanking by name Laura B, Matt and Yolanda, Sean F, Christopher Y, and Joel K. Uh, they and all the other patrons through their generous donations at sqpn.com/give. They make it possible for us to keep doing this. So we really appreciate that. They they not only this show but all the shows we do at StarQuest, and we have some. Some other shows you might want to check out at sqpn.com, and you could join them in, in that financial support if it's, if it's possible for you by going to sqpn.com slash give. So that's it from us. What did you think about these Denver airport conspiracies? Have you been to Denver airport? Have you seen any of the stuff there? Uh, what do you think of what we had to say about it? Or do you have any theories or conspiracies you'd like to share? You could do that by going to sqpn.com slash mysterious or the Jimmy Akins Mysterious World Facebook page and leave us some feedback there or send us an email to mysterious at sqpn.com or you can, uh, some people have been doing is going on to uh, Twitter. You can tweet us. We're at mys underscore world or, and, and you can use the hashtag of hashtag mysterious feedback, all one word. Uh, and if you haven't yet done so, please subscribe to the show in iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, tune in, uh, your favorite podcast app. I, I like uh, to use, uh, you could use Downcast, you could use Overcast, uh, uh, Pocket Cast is another one. There's there's a bunch of them out there. Or uh, you can go on YouTube and like, like Angel777 did and Christo4, and you can subscribe to the show there uh, and make sure you hit the bell when you do subscribe so you can get notification. Uh, like we said, you can find the links to these resources that Jimmy has given us on the Denver Airport Conspiracy and links to the mysterious headlines in our show notes at sqpn.com slash mysterious. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thank you, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest. <laughs>